were many, many, many people who said, what a fantastic thing, what a ridiculous thing, what a stupid thing to think that a few hundred thousand people like this can defy not only Britain, but really the United Nations and the rest of the world and get away with it. What a nerve. Who do they think they are? <laughs> well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we've actually won. We have. We have won. Make no difference. By 1964, independence under black rule had been conceded for all Britain's African colonies, except one. In southern Rhodesia, 200,000 white settlers still ruled the colony's three million blacks and were determined to keep it that way. To protect their lifestyle, the most luxurious in Africa, they chose a new prime minister with instructions to fight any British move which threatened white control. The era of civilized control in southern Rhodesia isn't estimated in a period of two years, as some people have tried to. We don't even stretch the era of civilization in southern Rhodesia to a hundred years. As far as we are concerned, it has got to be for all time. <laughs> And of course, ladies and gentlemen, that means only one thing, independence. I went uh, uh, and saw them in 1964 uh, and was frankly horrified. Ian Smith and his cabinet seemed to me to be like a set of white ostriches. Nothing that I or Harold Wilson or anybody else said to them uh, made the slightest difference. I said they'd got minds like Polaroid sunglasses. Uh, only welcome information penetrated. Anything unwelcome simply didn't get through. Smith refused independence on his terms, resolved to seize it by a unilateral declaration of independence. His security advisers told him UDI would be too dangerous. In October 1965, he called them to a meeting. Ian Smith in the chair said that uh, it now had to be a political decision. His colleagues would make that decision. Uh, we were all to prepare for UDI, but await a favorable opportunity for its implementation. Uh, that opportunity came surprisingly within a couple of weeks. The British Prime Minister arrived in Salisbury, desperate to find some compromise to avoid UDI. But Smith rejected any plan that might lead to majority rule. The African leaders looked to Britain to stop Smith, if necessary, by force. I've had to tell them that their demand for Britain to attempt to settle all Rhodesia's constitutional problems with a military invasion. This demand is out. And if there are those in this country who are thinking in terms of a thunderbolt hurtling from the sky and destroying their enemies, a thunderbolt in the shape of the Royal Air Force, <coughs> let me say that thunderbolt will not be coming. I think it was insane. I simply cannot understand the Prime Minister letting Ian Smith know that we wouldn't intervene by force because in a situation where you've so few cards in your hand, uh, you mustn't tell the other side that you have no cards. Uh, this, in effect, gave the Rhodesian government their opportunity. Uh, because, if I remember, it was within a matter of hours that the Rhodesian cabinet met on the 1st of November and confirmed the decision to go for UDI. The following message was sent today from the Prime Minister. 
I remind everyone in the services that first and foremost he is the servant of Rhodesia, his country and of its government. The British government will not hesitate to employ every device, legal or otherwise, that occurred to them to sow doubts in the minds of civil servants, members of the armed forces and of the prison service, and to detach these services from their loyalty to the government and to Rhodesia itself. Only Rhodesia could have dared a UDI. In other colonies, the British authorities could quell a settler rebellion, but Rhodesia was unique. They had their own police, civil service, and armed forces under the settlers' control. The only way Britain could stop UDI was by military invasion. But Harold Wilson had a parliamentary majority of only one, and a general election was coming. He feared the reaction of his electorate. An invasion could lead to a long and bloody war with their Rhodesian kith and kin. He asked his civil servants to come up with something else. We civil servants uh, uh, sat in our bath and the only thing we could come up with uh, was some middle course between the extreme of doing nothing, which Harold Wilson obviously wouldn't have, and the extreme of using force, unacceptable for many reasons. So all we could think of in the middle was economic sanctions. We believed right from the beginning that sanctions were a farce and that they're not going to work. Joshua Nkomo, the father of Zimbabwe nationalism, had long been fighting for African rights. He had been rounded up along with the other nationalist leaders. The Smith regime kept them in detention for the next 10 years. Sitting in, the, in detention in our camps in Gwanakudzingwa, where the railway line passed a few uh, meters away from our, our gate, we could see the tankers go past from Lorenzo Max. And as we had said to Mr. Wilson, when he said the sanctions were the trump card, and, and we said we did not believe they could be a sufficient trump card when Wilson himself had said nothing was going to be done to any uh, petroleum products coming from South Africa. We were worried for I suppose a month or so, uncertain. But nothing terrible happened. In fact, it was a little better than we had expected. And then it gradually got better, not worse. We became industrially self-sufficient. We developed a much broader base to our whole economy and our industry. It was a, a shot in the arm. Sanctions failed to bring the rebels to their knees. Black Commonwealth leaders demanded action Wilson, still determined not to use force, pursued Smith on land and on sea. He pleaded with him to promise the blacks majority rule so Britain could recognize white Rhodesia's independence and shed this thankless responsibility. Wilson made increasingly generous offers, but Smith turned down every one. In 1971, after six years of UDI, the new Conservative government went even further. Smith signed a deal with Sir Alec Douglas Hume. They agreed to remove some discrimination against Africans, but leave the whites in charge of the timetable for majority rule. Smith would go on ruling the country, and Britain would be shot of it. What do you think the Africans will think of the settlement? I think they're the happiest Africans in the world. <laughs> you think they'll approve of this settlement? Yeah. But British governments had always laid down one condition. The Africans must approve the deal. Morning. Britain appointed a royal commission, which dispatched teams across Rhodesia to discover the Africans' opinion. What? sections of the people in Rhodesia should be represented in, in the parliament. 
The nationalists seized their opportunity to tell the world they would never trust Smith to deliver majority rule. A moderate, Bishop Muzarewa, was picked as the respectable frontman by the nationalists who were running the campaign. We had no money, we had no funds, we had no transport, but somehow word spread just like wildfire the, throughout the country. And for the first time, uh, you know, everybody was active and it was no independence before majority rule, no independence before majority throughout the country. There will be no mistake uh, in, in their report that this was a very unanimous and definite uh, no from us. To Hume's disappointment, the commission reported the Africans turned down the deal. The nationalists had stopped Smith gaining legal independence, but were no closer to removing him. Many believed this could be done only by force. Ten years earlier, black violence had erupted, but it had been sporadic and disorganized. A group of nationalists, including Robert Mugabe, unhappy with Nkomo's leadership, broke away to form a new party, ZANU. In 1964, they declared war on the Smith regime. Both parties sent guerrilla cadres abroad for training, but for 10 years, they had little impact. We were then in detention, and as these cadres returned from uh, training, uh, there was no real uh, base f within the country for them to operate. We hadn't actually prepared the people for the armed struggle. And now for them to entertain guerrillas who were armed was quite a new experience and uh, a frightful one. And so as these cadres return, having walked long distances from uh, Zambia, they fell just into the hands of the, um, of the security forces and they just came to surrender. Our intelligence was so good at that stage that we knew who was coming, where they were likely to be going. We frequently knew the dates in advance and the place of crossing. Uh, we accounted for any number of groups in that period. Some disappeared without trace because that was the nature of the terrorist war at that stage. Uh, our success rate was as near as, damn it, 100%. The villagers believed the guerrillas had little chance against the superior forces of the Smith regime and frequently informed on them. The ZANU leadership realized they needed to change tactics. They turned to the teachings of Mao Zedong. The Chinese instructors in the various camps in Tanzania were educating and instructing uh, our cadres and using the Maoist approach that you must use the people. And amongst the people, you are like a fish in water. Outside the people, without them, you are like a fish outside water. <laughs> Zanu would come at dusk and require the villagers to attend meetings, lasting through the night. Mixing entertainment with politics, they taught the people that if they closed ranks behind the fighters, the Smith regime could be defeated. The major message we were bringing to the people was, now we want our country. We are no more politicians who speak by the word of mouth. We are people who want to fight for our country and get it back through the barrel of the gun, as it was got from us. Our sources of information began to dry up. Uh, a new pattern emerged. Uh, we were reacting to guerrilla activity 
more than in a position to preempt it or do something about it in advance. The Rhodesians were taken by surprise when just before Christmas 1972, the guerrillas launched a series of attacks on isolated farms. Over the next five years, the war spread throughout the country as thousands of guerrillas infiltrated. Rhodesia had been protected by its white neighbors, South Africa and Mozambique, leaving Zambia the guerrillas only route in. When the Portuguese left Mozambique, the whole of Rhodesia became vulnerable to attack from the east. With Nkomo's forces still infiltrating from Zambia and Mugabe's now coming from Mozambique, the Rhodesian security forces had over a thousand miles of border to guard. They could no longer stop the guerrillas coming. The guerrillas would strike without warning, only to vanish afterwards among the local people. Using anti-terrorist techniques learned fighting with the British in Malaya and Kenya, the Rhodesian security forces hit hard at villages suspected of sheltering guerrillas. The black population was caught between the demands of the security forces for information and the guerrillas' retribution if they talked. We don't think Rhodesia's about to collapse. No, I don't think so at all. I don't know why we should think that at all. We've had no indication that there's going to be any uh, a fear of Rhodesia what, collapsing. What about the wall that's going on? Don't you notice the wall? Yes, I've got a sun in the wall. But um, doesn't that make a difference to you? Um, no, I don't like the wall. That's the one part I don't like, but it's essential. They ought to have known that we were losing. But because of the effects of propaganda in the country, uh, it probably wasn't fully enough appreciated by the bulk of the whites that uh, we had now moved into that not only no-win situation, but losing situation. The guerrilla war had accomplished what British diplomacy had failed to. The Smith regime was now ready to bring blacks into government, but not Mugabe. Released from detention, he fled across the border to ZANU's guerrilla base in Mozambique and joined forces with Nkomo in an uneasy alliance called the Patriotic Front. Ian Smith looked for a moderate black leader inside the country. We started negotiating with the internal black people as a result of a suggestion put to me by Alec Douglas Hume. He said, can't you get together with some of your internal blacks? Because if you can make a solution which clearly indicates that the blacks are in, and in fact that the blacks are in the majority, he said, I believe the whole world will have to accept that. Smith tried a clever trick. He agreed to form a government with a majority of black ministers, thus securing Bishop Muzarewa as his front man. But he ensured that real power stayed with the whites by keeping the civil service and security forces firmly in white hands. Smith and Muzarewa argued that with a black government in office, there was no reason for the guerrillas to keep fighting and the world should accept Rhodesia's independence as legitimate. I'm thinking that independence per there Salisbury is... There is, is no bit. independence in Salisbury and you know it. That is irrelevant to us. If you didn't know that, know it now. I, I know. That is irrelevant. I know that's your We argument. are fighting to get the transfer of power. If the two or three chaps decide to join Smith, they become part and parcel of the regime against which we are fighting. And it doesn't matter whether that regime has got black or white face. That's not what we are fighting. We are not fighting against Smith because he's a white man. We're fighting against Smith because his regime is unacceptable. It is a, a, it is a fascist regime, it is a racist regime, and that's all there is to it. responded to the call to lay down their arms by bringing the war to the heart of Salisbury. 
they ignited Rhodesia's largest petrol depot, destroying millions of gallons of fuel. Smith's scheme to end the war had failed. This is Voice of Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. The time is nine o'clock. In Rhodesia, the illegal regime had adopted the name Zimbabwe Rhodesia. In April 1979, Smith held the country's first majority rule election. Bishop Muzarewa succeeded him as prime minister, but the regime remained an international outcast. They had only one hope left. Two weeks after Muzarewa, Mrs. Thatcher won her election. If she recognized Muzarewa's government, Rhodesia would be legally independent. No one questions that there is a majority of black traditions in Parliament, a majority of black ministers in the Cabinet, and a black Prime Minister. Now, starting from that basis, we believe that there is a possibility of getting some agreement on going forward. And I would say this very, very firmly. Unfortunately, there is still terrorism operating. But we must make certain that the bullet does not beat the ballot. Mrs. Thatcher seemed set on recognizing the Muzarewa regime, but her foreign secretary was not enthusiastic. In my judgment, that would have been really disastrous. I mean, I don't think it would have been, we'd have been driven to it, but what would have happened would be um, uh, that the war would have intensified. I think you would have found that the that the Soviet Union would have become infinitely more involved. And I think the Commonwealth would have broken up. Uh, I think there might very well have been sanctions against Britain in the United Nations. We shouldn't have had a friend in Europe. I mean, it's uh, idle to deny that there were differences of opinion in the Conservative Party about what the, what the right thing to do was. And so it took a bit of time to get ourselves sorted out. Three months after the election, at the Commonwealth Summit in Lusaka, Britain announced that after years on the sidelines, she was going to take center stage. Mrs. Thatcher backed away from recognizing the Muzarewa government. Instead, she offered the Patriotic Front guerrillas, whom previously she had labeled terrorists, an equal place with the Muzarewa government at a conference in London. Mrs. Thatcher's U-turn infuriated the conservative right wing. They mobilized for attack at the annual party conference in Blackpool. I must say, I went up to Blackpool with a certain amount of, uh, of, of trepidation. Uh, you know, hang carrying some banners around the, around the and, and, and the hall filled up all during lunch. Uh, it, 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 there wasn't a seat to be had. Everybody forecast there was going to be blood on the floor and it was going to be mine. We all want peace in Rhodesia, but not peace at any price. The Conservative Party cannot weigh the pro-Soviet, totalitarian, terrorist patriotic front in the same scale as the pro-Western, pro-democratic government of Bishop Muzarek. I ask you to face the fact so long as the British government supports sanctions and continue sanctions, we are supporting the patriotic front and we are supporting the drive of Soviet imperialism in Africa. Think what it would mean if we threw over the chance of a settlement at this stage. I believe that the government were right to try to get a settlement were right, even at this 11th hour, to seek to get the parties together, were right to get the backing of the Commonwealth, were right to take this chance, once and for all, of ending the war. I give you my word that it will not be the fault of this government if we fail. Lord Carrington and Mrs. Thatcher carried their party, but their biggest problem still remained. 
When the Lancaster House Conference opened on the 10th of September 1979, the Rhodesian War came to London. With diplomacy their only weapon, the British hoped they could bluff each side into believing it would form the government of independent Zimbabwe. Bishop Muzarewa came to Lancaster House because it was his only way to win legal recognition. It was not clear he was in charge of his team. His colleague, Ian Smith, had outwitted the British before. The Rhodesians hoped the PF would walk out, leaving Carrington no option but to settle with them. Patriotic front leader Joshua Nkomo hoped a deal could be reached, leading to fresh elections, which he believed he would win. He was reluctantly accompanied by his partner, Robert Mugabe, who thought victory in war more likely than the conference to bring his party to power. Our position is that uh, we are the genuine and authentic representatives of the people of Zimbabwe. And we haven't acquired that title by some, some monkey tricks. It's been by dying in battle. And we have that obligation. Some of us see mass graves as we sit in that conference. Everybody viewed it, the, the conference, as the greatest possible distrust. I mean, and me. I hated every minute of it. It was, it was a, 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 an appalling, uh, nerve-wracking business because the consequences of it going wrong, I mean, not just for the people who were fighting the war, not to, to just because of the, that, but I mean, the consequences to Britain and British policy were really rather frightening. Carrington wanted a British governor in charge while new elections were held. But first, he had to get Muzarewa to stand down. The bishop had sent for me some time after midnight. It was about two o'clock in the morning, I think, that I arrived to find him in his bedroom in what I would describe as a prayerful mode. Fortunately, he didn't ask me to get down and pray with him, though he had done on other occasions. He was worried that, uh, as he put it, he was on the horns of a dilemma. Uh, whether to accept now what the British were proposing, which was in effect that he should stand on as Prime Minister and accept a British governor during the elections. We discussed it, and neither of us could think of any precedent in the history of Africa where any African leader had relinquished power and ever been able to recover it. Well, uh, to, to be honest and frank, I, uh, I did not like it, thinking humanly. But um, after some thought and prayer overnight, I decided to step down. The Bishop Mazareba told us that he had made the decision based on political intelligence and his own understanding of what the British had in mind for him and for the country that he was uh, looking to the Foreign Office in Britain and to God to see him right, which perhaps was expecting a little bit too much from two such unlikely collaborators. I could see through the Lancaster House agreement early on. I remember telling them, Carrington as well, that that constitution they were trying to sell us would give us a PF government. At that time, remember, Mugabe and Nkoma were together. They accused me of being an alarmist. This was the talk in the corridors. Uh, I remember Lord Carrington saying to me, but my dear Mr. Smith, the whole thing has been planned to ensure that that will not take place. Smith, unable to persuade the Salisbury delegation to heed his warning, left for home. He was succeeded as the figure the white Rhodesians relied on to safeguard their interests by General Walls. Suspicious of Foreign Office assurances, he sought a meeting with Mrs. Thatcher. She said certain things to me which made me think that the kind of political solution for which we had always hoped, uh, non-racial, multi-interest, anti-Marxist, that kind of political solution, was going to triumph. And uh, unhappy though we may have been, one had to accept those assurances that it was that was the general flow, the way it was going to work. 
Having secured the Salisbury delegation's agreement, Carrington tried to make the PF follow suit. This evening, Lord Carrington pretended that all had been well, pretended that there had been progress. As far as the Patriotic Front is concerned, there have not been discussions at all with anybody in respect of the substantive matters regarding the ceasefire. And we insist that there can never be any agreement. This is just rubbish, absolute rubbish. Nobody will take cognizance of it. With our government's acceptance of the British proposals, I believe there's a way open uh, for a fairly quick return to normality as far as the political scene is concerned. But with or without the Patriotic Front? Uh, with or without the Patriotic Front. Thank you, you've answered it. I don't care. But if the front doesn't come in, General, the war will go on. That's right. And then the front will be demolished. With the conference still in progress, the Rhodesian security forces launched an all-out assault. They unleashed destruction on both Zambia and Mozambique in a final attempt to demolish the Patriotic Front. They carried out very extensive raids all the way down the Limpopo Valley, very nearly to the capital of Mozambique. The military temperature was rising all the time, and unless we did something fast to bring things to a conclusion, everything that had been gained in the conference would be thrown away. Carrington and Mrs. Thatcher took an enormous risk. They sent Lord Soames out as governor, even though no ceasefire had been agreed. Carrington gambled that if he moved forward with Musarewa's government, the PF would not want to be left out. For the first time in its history, Rhodesia was ruled by a British governor alone. His only warm welcome was from a small group of loyalists outside Government House. It didn't change my mind. I was going to a very tricky situation. It didn't alter that. And of course, the fact that I was arriving before Lancaster House was finished made it a lot harder. With his governor a sitting target in Salisbury, Carrington tried to push the Patriotic Front into signing. We've been given an ultimatum for 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Is it 11? Yeah. For 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. The answer is an clear and eloquent no to Carrington. The answer is no. And he and his governor can go hang. There is a limit to power. And here Carrington's power ends. If he wants to wreck it, let him go ahead. He has a British governor stuck in Salisbury. And as far as we are concerned, our orders to escalate the armed struggle stand. We, and if need be, we will issue fresh ones this week. And it will be all out war with a British governor in place. The final session of the conference ended in failure. Mugabe, not trusting the British, raised objections to details. He believed that if he continued the war, he would eventually win independence on his own terms. But he needed the support of one man, President Samora Machel, who provided his base in Mozambique. For eight years, the Marxist leader had been Mugabe's crucial ally. The Foreign Office made this appeal to the President. There was a chance, and there wouldn't be another one, for Mozambique to escape the consequences of the war continuing. Uh, President Machel had exerted his influence with the Patriotic Front before. Um, if ever there was the moment to do so, it was, it was now. Mozambique had a representative at the conference. He relayed the British appeal to President Machel and received fresh instructions. I eventually had to convey a message to the Patriotic Front that we, the Mozambican government, did not feel that there were any issues at stake at that stage of the conference which would justify 
uh, the, the breaking of the conference, that we were not willing to accept the blame for the conference breaking on such minor issues. And I think it was a way of, of, of assuring the Zimbabweans, of assuring Mugabe and Komo that they could take this plunge. We were with them for that plunge. But if they did not take the plunge, then um, things were not going to be as they had been before. Machel's message arrived as Mugabe was leaving London to take his case to the United Nations. He abandoned his flight and accepted the agreement. Yes, even as I signed the document, I, I was not a happy man at all. I felt uh, we had been cheated to some extent, that uh, we had agreed to uh, um, uh, a deal which would, to some extent, rob us of uh, the victory we had uh, hoped we would achieve uh, in the field. Nos levou em, em breve. É que a Magritte é corajosa. Não tem vergonha de ler as páginas da história. Enquanto outros governos, não. Eles poderiam perguntar por que, que apoia um, um, uma senhora que é do conservador. Mas quando tem a razão, e quando tem a força para isso, quando tem a razão e quando tem a força para isso, nós apoiamos. E já resolveu o problema rodiziano. Portanto, não falhamos. To get agreement on paper had been difficult. To get it implemented on the ground would be even harder. Lord Soames had to conduct an election under the guns of two armies. He had to rely on one, the Rhodesian security forces, to keep order, with no way to make them obey. I mean, I didn't have command as commander-in-chief of the forces over the security forces that a governor would normally expect to have. I mean, I had to persuade and cajole and carry along and, and just interfere where I thought it was all right to interfere and sometimes close my eyes to what um, I, I would normally have liked to interfere with if I felt I'd really had to pass, so to do. The governor's only troops were a few hundred lightly armed Commonwealth soldiers waiting in 16 remote assembly points to which the guerrilla commanders had promised their men would come. British intelligence repeatedly said that uh, there was something like six or eight thousand uh, Zanla guerrillas inside the country. But when we were now asked to declare uh, how many guerrillas we had, uh, we chose to declare 20,000. If everybody thought we had 8,000 and were willing to deliver 20, then clearly we didn't have anybody else left. In fact, we had um, a very large army left uh, who remained as political commissars in the country, just simply to assure that uh, uh, we would win the election. By this morning, another thousand or more had checked in, bringing the latest total to over 17,000 men from all over the country, but mainly in the east and northeast, men of Robert Mugabe's Zanla forces. As of this time, the numbers now exceed both British and Rhodesian estimates of how many nationalist guerrillas there are inside the country. The Rhodesians are claiming that many of those coming forward are women and children, quickly recruited to boost PF numbers. They sent in their Mojibas, that's the sort of youth league. Uh, they sent them in with a few anteaten old muskets and a few rusty old weapons uh, that couldn't possibly have been the, the, the terrorist weapons and equipment. Uh, and meantime, the, the terrorists themselves mingled with the population and made damn certain which way they were going to vote in the forthcoming election. <laughs> The Whites placed their hopes on Bishop Muzarewa to defeat the Marxist Mugabe and show the world that a moderate government was the genuine choice of the people. He launched an extravagant campaign under the slogan, I have achieved the peace, back me, I'm the winner.
But this time, the opposition was more formidable. The Patriotic Front were no longer a united team, and Como kept the title PF for his own party. Mugabe's ZANU had decided to fight the election separately, to sort out once and for all which of them would be leader. Nkomo's supporters from the minority Ndebele tribe closed ranks behind him. Soon they began to complain of intimidation. To say intimidation is to put it very low. It was not just intimidation, we lost people. We lost the candidate, we lost about 18 to 20 uh, party workers killed by the, the, the young men who were deployed by, by ZANU uh, outside the assemble points. We learned later that they never were uh, committed to assemble points. They were given a task that uh, during elections they would see to it that everyone in that area voted ZANU. Amidst growing accusations of ZANU intimidation, Lord Soames delayed Mugabe's return for three weeks. The biggest crowd ever seen in Rhodesia welcomed home the candidate most feared by the whites. We are the party that fought against the rebellion, the party that fought for legitimacy. We made it possible for Lord Soames to come to Salisbury as governor. But today we have become Lord Soames' number one enemy. I had the same picture that everybody had had, that he was a, something of a Marxist ogre. And that uh, he'd as soon start to try to look at you and all that. And that, uh, that he was... Um, in quotes, a bad man. I mean, that was, that was uh, the image that uh, he'd carried. I want to see the freest and the fairest elections possible in this country, with as many political parties who want to take part in it. But intimidation is rife, violence is rife, and I've got to do everything that I can to minimize this. And hence my ordinance yesterday. Lord Soames gave himself the legal power to ban any party guilty of intimidation. I should warn that should he use those powers to ban ZANU from participating in, in election, then ZANU would hold itself absolved completely from the commitment to the Lancaster House Agreement. I'm saying, Lord Soames, choose. Is it war or peace? It was really the most important decision, I think, which I had to take throughout the whole of the two months leading up to the election. Lord Soames knew that his men in the assembly camps were virtual hostages to thousands of guerrillas tensed for action if he decided to ban ZANU. But the Rhodesian security forces had the power to seize control if they didn't get their way, and they wanted Mugabe banned. There were quite enough people who you know, didn't think like we thought and were prepared to do almost anything to keep uh, Rhodesia under white control. As he drove away from an election rally, Mugabe narrowly escaped assassination when a bomb exploded under his motorcade. This is another instance of the least said the better. But as Mugabe himself said at a later stage, we had spent years trying to kill each other. There were things went on during the elections uh, that would not have been happening in normal times. A series of bombs exploded across the country. A bus filled with Mozarewa supporters was hit by a rocket. Evidence pointed to clumsy attempts by the security forces to incriminate ZANU. I think it became apparent towards the 
end, I mean, the last week or so, that uh, Mr. Mugabe was going to win, um, I think that it was, uh, at that time, it was not a solution which I thought would be as well received as, <laughs> as some of the others. Some of the governor's foreign office officials advised him to ban ZANU in a few areas of high intimidation. This should take enough seats from Mugabe to stop him coming to power. We got word from within Lord Soames's team that there was a group which wanted us banned. Um, but Lord Soames was said to be resisting this. Among my staff, there was a difference of view here, a perfectly understandable and acceptable difference of view, but I had to take the decision. I believed he was going to win anyhow. And I used to say, well, you must remember, this is Africa. This isn't little Puddleton in the marsh. And um, they behave differently, and they think nothing of sticking ten poles up each other's, whatnot, you know, and doing filthy, beastly things to each other. It, it does happen, I'm afraid. It's a very wild thing in an election. Lord Soames decided that a partial ban was not worth the risk, because Mugabe was heading for a landslide victory. As polling day dawned, it became clear he was right. Well, I think we realised then that uh, uh, what we'd predicted all along had come to pass. The uh, massive intimidation had had its intended effect. And there was no way this was going to be a free and fair election. There was no way that uh, a, a political solution which any anti-Marxist people could favour could flow from it. I suppose all the times that was the most dangerous. And um, the, the most dangerous thing, I suppose, was the, a coup, a, a white coup. And uh, this was very much, I know, in uh, Lord Soames's mind during the whole of this period. On Sunday the 2nd of March, while the votes were being counted, General Walls, still in control of the army, summoned the governor's top officials to Rhodesian Security Forces headquarters. We reminded the governor's staff of the uh, terms of the agreement, uh, and we asked that the elections be set aside, declared not free and fair. We said that we had promised a free and fair election. There had been an election which, broadly speaking, was free and fair, and we were going to help the government which emerged from it in every way we could. Typical diplomatic language as to why nothing could be done, a wringing of hands and a, well, oh, we can't do anything, and, uh, you know, it's terribly difficult. The United Nations have been here and people from all over the world are watching us now, and how can we possibly stop it at this stage? We certainly felt that the people we were talking to were beneath contempt. It was a very tense meeting, but there were people who realised fully, and in fact I believe that Walls also realised that any imprudent action would result in real disaster for the white community. When push came to shove, Walls took the right decision right the way down the line, including deciding that he would not support a coup at the end. And there was much pressure, I have no doubt, put on him for that. Finally, I will recap on the results and the state of the parties. ZANU PF, 57 seats. The Patriotic Front, 20 seats. The UANC, as ZANU supporters celebrated, many whites were packing their bags. Mugabe had to do something to reassure them. He flew to Mozambique to consult President Samora Machel. Samora felt we should also include Ian Smith in the government. But um, we said, OK, we'll think about that one. Uh, so as to kind of uh, 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 
avoid any uh, possible uh, rift in the unity of the nation. But when we went to President Nyerere, President Nyerere said, oh, no, Ian Smith, of course not. Uh, 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 we couldn't go that far, but we felt uh, that uh, we should include some whites in, in, in the government. The governor, now working closely with his prime minister, also advised reconciliation. Mugabe should meet the general he had been fighting for seven years and invite him to stay on as his commander. During the course of the discussion, I said to him, uh, but how can I, uh, as an avowed anti-Marxist, work for a person like you? And he said, well, you must know, General, that the teachings of Karl Marx are identical though, to those of Jesus Christ. And I said, I, I can't possibly accept that, but I, I, I can't argue with you on an intellectual thing like that now. General Walls agreed to serve independent Zimbabwe. Here, as throughout the empire, once British rule was over, the whites who stayed on continued to prosper. It was the minorities at odds with the new regimes who suffered most from the end of the British Empire. That was the final program in our series, End of Empire. Next week, the start of a 13-part documentary series on a very grand scale indeed. It's Soldiers, hosted by author Frederick Forsyth. A preview in a moment.